Hi, everybody. We're the Skeleton Crew, and today we're going to talk about the fifth and final episode in Prehistoric Planet Season 2. This is the North America episode. Uh, we really liked a lot of the segments here. Spoiler alert, we enjoyed the episode. Um, we're going to talk about what we enjoyed about it. But before we get into it, a couple of things. One, I'm Dr. James Napoli. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. I'm Amelia Zietlow, a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Alexander Rubenstahl, a PhD candidate at Yale University. And I'm Dalton Meyer, a PhD candidate at Yale University. And together, yeah. we're, the, we're skeleton the skeleton crew. We're the skeleton crew. We're the skeleton crew. I don't know when this episode will come out because all of life is chaos and we haven't set the release schedule yet. But uh, what I do know is that it will be coming out before June 17th. And that's important because on June 17th, we are going to be running our first ever charity live stream. We're going to be raising money to donate on behalf of the Trevor Project. Uh, we really believe in the mission of the Trevor Project, and given that it's Pride Month, we wanted to do what we can to support their um, organization and their mission, which we think is really important. So details are still being worked out of the charity live stream, but what we can say is that we will be streaming on Saturday, June 17th. We'll be streaming from approximately 12 p.m. Eastern Time to 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and we 12 a.m. Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry, 12, 12 p.m. to 12 a.m. <laughs> 12 p.m. to 12 p.m. Right, so. yes, noon to midnight. Um, 59 second stream. Yes. Um, we're going to play different video games. We're all going to be together on stream. Uh, and we're going to have integrated ways for you to donate funds that we can use to make a donation to the Trevor Project. Um, if you have not subscribed to our channel yet, we would appreciate it if you did, because we will be updating you guys on the status of the live stream in some community posts and future videos. And if you subscribe, you'll make sure that you see all of the notifications when they appear. So stay tuned. We hope to see all of you uh, in the audience of our charity live stream. We're really excited to do something like this. Yeah. And we haven't said it yet, but right now we're sitting at around 4,500 4, subscribers. If Everyone who subscribes to our channel donates even a dollar. We'll raise almost five thousand dollars for a really great, uh, really really great cause. So, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I mean again, don't underestimate the amount of influence you can have uh, when a large number of people do a small amount in service of something. Um, I think we could we can probably raise a not insignificant amount of money. That's why we're doing this, and um, you know we want to see what our community is capable of giving. And, uh, you know, what good we can do. So uh, that's that's the current info for our charity live stream. Subscribe to stay appraised of everything as the situation develops further. Um, with that, I think it's time to talk about North America. Yeah. What was the first segment again? Cats, uh, Al Alamosaurus beach. and then Cats on the Beach. It goes yeah. beach, swim, trike. No. Oh, no. Beach, swim, lake, trike. Hold. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The biblical order. Um, yeah. Praise, praise, praise be the Lord. Right. So the first segment, we have a, a beach migration of Alamosaurus. Um, mm -hmm. Alamosaurus is a cool dinosaur. It's an enormous sauropod. I, I, yeah. It's not known from very complete remains. Uh, it is a titanosaur. Like, um, titanosaurs are mostly represented from South America, if I'm correct. I mean, they're generally yeah. Gondwanan. I, I, feel I mean, like, the good stuff is, like, there's plenty of Asian ones. Yeah, that's true. No, that's true. And there are a good number of European. It's, it's, Alamosaurus is an opis, the. It's the Coelacodon or something. Yeah, so it's, I, I think it's closely related to Saltosaurus, which is, which is that, like, a lot of those are South American. Right. So, I mean, it's probably part of a South American radiation of Titanosaurs. Um, it is interesting that it appears in North America after. Um, North America is unique in that for most of the Cretaceous, or for the late Cretaceous, sauropods are not known from almost any North American site. In the latest Cretaceous, Alamosaurus is found in southern sites. It's quite common, actually. Um, we've never found a complete skeleton or anything approximating a complete skeleton of Alamosaurus, but there's a lot of remains attributed to it. 
Um, and what we have indicates that it's a very, very large animal. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, so we get to see it. It's, it's neat. And it dies. Well, an old one died. Yeah. yeah. You that know, made me sad. But he had a whole, he had a, he had a long life. He no, it did. It, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, it made, it made me sad in like, not the same way as like the baby easy story is dying. <laughs> It made, it made me sad and like the uh, the end of the long noble life. You know, it's 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 always sad. Wistful kind of sad. They yeah. get him at like seventy, and I you know I, I wouldn't be shocked if they got even farther than that. Yeah. yeah. Although, like dinosaurs in general don't aren't attested to having very long lifespans. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if large sauropods were able to get like toward a hundred, but. There was an old idea, right, that dinosaurs got big because they lived for a really long time, and that like mm -hmm. large, really large sauropods were really old. Right. Well, they were. They kind of the idea was that like um, they were like uh, ectothermic reptiles, and that they had what is it? What's the indeterminate growth, growth. Indeterminate, indeterminate growth. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Which I I think, based on my current understanding of the reptile growth literature, even that's like not really true. Like no, yeah. It, in captivity, when they live long enough, they'll stop. Right. Or they'll yeah. at least slow. Where it's well, right, right. It's what the reason it's indeterminate to my understanding is that it's mammals literally stop skeletal growth, like our mm -hmm. growth plates fuse, and there is no further increase in size. Um, reptiles don't have uh growth plates or epiphyses the way that mammals do, and so reptiles will continue the process of growth, but the actual amount of size increase is negligible after a certain point. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like if you let an alligator grow to be like, you know, 200 years old, that it will be twice as large as a 100 year old alligator like that. It's just not how it works. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd say 70 would probably be a pretty old sauropod. Did it have. Um, big, did it have the appropriate scoots on its back? Yeah, it had osteoderms. OK, yeah. osteoderms. Sorry, I don't really like these. I think some people, I mean, with, with regards to Alamosaurus osteoderms, and we'll discuss them more in our video on Alamosaurus in the Jurassic World React series, because it's in the game. Um, but there is a tendency to kind of make the, the like back osteoderms with these big spikes. Um, when that, the, well, the fossils of what we have could be interpreted as the base of like a, a big spike, but could also just be interpreted as something that is 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 nodular more or less so i think i think what's shown in the show is still pretty faithful to the fossil record yeah no i i, I agree it seems very reasonable to me um yeah so it's cool to see alamosaurus it doesn't get talked about a lot because you know we we will refer to um western north america colloquially as the hell creek a lot because the hell creek formation is like it's one rock unit from a particular depositional setting in the latest Cretaceous. And it's apparently completely contemporary with the Lance formation and the Frenchman formation and the Scholard formation. And I, I think there's another one. A little bit of um Horseshoe Canyon? No, Horseshoe Canyon is early older? Mistrictian. Older. Um I okay. think Fox Hills? Maybe. Oh, that sounds right. I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, let me I'm gonna Google that to make sure. I'm pretty um, sure it is, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no. Fox Hills, it's roughly equivalent. Um, there's that really, there's a really nice ornithomimosaur skeleton from the Fox Hills that's in the South Dakota Museum. I was unable to digitize it because my scanner died, but it's a beautifully preserved ornithomimosaur skeleton. Tragic. Um, and beautiful, like, white, goby-like bone preservation. It, it It's not very <laughs> productive, but it's... Uh, it doesn't have a lot of dinosaurs. I think it, I think Fox Hills is interpreted as actually like outlying islands and the remnants of the WIS. So mm -hmm. like dinosaurs are not as common as they are in the other formations, but what's there is beautifully preserved. Um, I, it would it would be a cool place to look for stuff at some point. But anyway, um, the Hell Creek ecosystem is like centered in like you know Montana, Wyoming, Alberta, Canada. There's an entirely uh, you know, or seemingly separate southern ecosystem in North America that is much less fossiliferous, which means that it has much fewer fossils in it, and we don't know as much about it. The fossils that we find are more fragmentary, more badly preserved, um, and just less abundant. 
there's not much that we know of that seems to cross that boundary. Tyrannosaurus Rex seems to, and Taurosaurus seems to. We talked about this a little bit in our Taurosaurus video. Alamosaurus has never been found in any of the Hell Creek sediment. Um, and while the quality, I don't think the quality of the fossil record allows us to say it was never there, um, it sure is weird that it's one of the more common things down south, and it has literally mm-hmm. never been found in some of the most intensively worked sediments on the continent. Not even yeah. a fragment or a toe or anything. Right, not a like, sore I mean, tooth, like nothing. It's something that, could, it's one of those things where just like even a tiny piece could overturn it, but yeah, it yeah. is, it's a well work. It's, it's a little weird. Yeah. Um, what I'm getting at is that there's a lot of attention given to the Hell Creek ecosystem because it's really well studied and really productive, but it is nice to see a taste of the southern dinosaur biota. Um, mm-hmm. there, there's good sites in uh, southern Texas and Big Bend National Park, I think southern New Mexico, and a lot of Mexico actually is really good, like late Mistrictian stuff. Um, anyway, sorry for the stun lock about Alamosaurus. Well, it's not, I mean, it's an animal in the show yeah, lot. That's true. Then I'm not sorry about it. It dies, it, it goes. It, it get you know it gets owned it happens but you know what <laughs> but you know what he uh he dies a natural death yeah yeah i was kind of i was very worried that he was going to be something that oh, i'm almost certain happened to sort of like old sauropod that died which would be that they were probably scavenged while they were still alive right no he he gets to die on the beach by the coastline yeah in the afternoon sun it, he's Honestly, maybe the luckiest wild animal that has ever existed. <laughs> Way to go. Yeah. But then T-Rex appear. Crunch. Well, no, okay. first the little Trudons appear. Yes, yeah. which they don't name in that segment, but that's the same model that is Pectinodon, right? Mm-hmm. I think they color oh, changed yeah. it a little bit, but it's model-wise yeah. about the same. Okay. I think, you know, small... Theropods are almost entirely unknown from down south. The, the stuff we have is real bad quality. Um, that means they weren't there, right? Well, I mean, we do have enough to know they were there. And there's one name okay. taxon. There's the. I, I know you're being. Yeah, I know you're being. Fiki. Yes. Um, there's the Dromaeosaurid Deneo Bellator. That's from mm. that area. It's right. from southern North America. I thought it was Mexican. It is Mexican. But I mean, you know, say southern, southern North America. Sure. Okay. Um, I don't think there's a name Troodontid. So they probably just decided not to name it. Yeah. I think they're a throw down to teeth though. Like we kn- we know that there was stuff around, but we don't know what they are. So they snip snap. They snip snap. Um, but they can't get in. Too, too small. <laughs> no entry. I for for half a minute when that was happening, I was envisioning that one comic. Of like it's I don't know if it's a a, a trudontid or a dromaeosaur that's like picking at a, a sauropod carcass and it explodes it just obliterates. It. <laughs> I was uh, so for those of you who don't know when large animals die when any animal dies sometimes they bloat with gases because there's still bacteria and stuff living inside them and they're still doing their thing. Um, and by doing their thing I mean breathing and when they breathe they're creating and and they break down their food they're making gas. And in a dead animal that's not breathing or expelling the gas naturally in any other way, the gas builds up and sometimes they pop. Um, uh, I'll throw up a video of a whale so, exploding right now, just, just yeah, so that well, everybody knows what we, we're talking about. This yes, will and if you do, you, viewer. heads up, do not watch the video if you are sensitive to things such as whales blowing up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The whale that was blown up intentionally with dynamite. This yes. was a natural explosion, which actually, there was one that happened in a city, right? Was it, it was it in Japan? It was they in had Portland. like a dead whale on a, on a... Oh, no, no, that one was no, Japan, no, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, the one that yeah. blew up naturally. Like... Yeah, it didn't anyway, it take out a couple cars. Like, That's so fucking It cool. was bad, yeah. Yeah, yeah it um, smelled bad. 
So someone, and if we could find the artwork, we can show it. Someone drew like a little Trudon picking at a sauropod and just getting geysered off. It was, it's really sad, but really funny. Um, but that's all I was thinking about. And I was like, man, too bad this show is not gory because that would have been hilarious. I, I thought they were going to go anyways. up its ass. Because like scavengers often go up the ass. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. You know, just like I was Chloe right, yeah. eating it from the inside out. I would have, I guess, maybe picking at the face, but I think, you know, giving even even that I think would be a little much for this. The sauropod, there's not a lot to pick at. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in any case, entry is attained. Tyrannosaurus <laughs> appears um, and takes huge yeah. bite. And then it gets to the face off that we've seen in all the promotional stuff for this season. <laughs> on one time, on the one side, you have Tyrannosaurus Rex. The animal with the proportionally strongest bite force that has ever existed. Um, it is the apparent pinnacle of carnivorous theropod dinosaur evolution. On the other hand, you have a, a Tim Burton monster that is essentially <laughs> the density of smoke and uh, is all just his angles and fabric. Right. Every <laughs> afternoon he breaks his legs or every morning he breaks his legs and every afternoon he breaks his arms. Um, but there's two of them and they've got a 10 foot long spear for a head. And and they also, and this is important, honk. They honk. They honk. They do honk. Yeah. Um, hey. um the T-Rex also has the Jurassic Park roar. I am I the only nerd who noticed that? I, I was Doesn't it really? I, I don't that. think it does. It does. It does. It makes one no, of the it, it is not the canonical roar, but it is one of the sounds that was invented for Jurassic Park. All right. I believe it. I our audio experience was a little diminished by the way that we were watching it right. through just because I'm gonna try and watch it. Really watch Apple right TV. Now, but. Yeah. The um and uh, to clarify, but our friend James Napoli, uh, the doctor, whatever, is saying it's not. He's not saying that it's unlikely um or impossible that a Tyrannosaurus Rex could be chased off by. Two animals that you know weigh much less than it, and I don't know if, if they walked, you know, walked into a tree too fast would be injured beyond recovery. They're essentially a bag full of shrapnel. Like, yeah, it is. They do have big, long, pointy. And I saw a video yeah. going around that that I'm not. I wouldn't say convinced. Yeah, yeah kind of convinced me even more of it. There's like a great video of turns assaulting a polar bear. That's oh, like wow. doing. I wouldn't honestly. I wouldn't be surprised if that was probably one of the big, se- ins- like, points of inspiration for this sequence. But it's just like a dozen Arctic terns harassing a polar bear. So basically, animals may- animals that are bones and organs in like tissue paper uh, versus the large. I think. I think right. Largest they're- terrestrial carnivore. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. And 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 it's they just keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just keep flying by, pecking it, and then the polar bear is like, "Fine, I I'll guess I'll leave." They're in that well, context. Let's... I think they're protecting their young. Uh, they have like a nest nearby, hmm. and that's kind of like how if you've seen videos of tiny birds harassing like hawks and eagles, mm-hmm. hawks and eagles are like also bags of glass, but like they're bigger bags of glass and they're pretty strong. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. like like they they are they're they're tempered glass too, or not tempered glass, whatever. They're 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 like plexiglass. Um, at least relative to the bags of glass that are the tiny songbirds that are harassing them. And I know at least growing up, like when I would see it both on documentaries and in, in, you know, in real life, we've got back, back home where I'm from, we have a lot of red tail hawks and like little sparrows and things will dive bomb them. And it's just like, Jesus, like that hawk could easily take those birds, but it's just so not worth their time. Like it's not worth their time. And like, we were kind of talking about this after the episode yesterday like it's not worth the risk of infection because it's like even if they only get a little poke in this is the mesozoic like if we're going back to this beach scene t-rex does not have health care it's living in america (laughs) so you know if it gets if it gets if it gets infected it could be screwed 
You know, right. even if it's just a nick, you know, you don't know what the, these like pterosaurs are disgusting. They're carrying God knows what kinds of diseases. I would not want to be anywhere near them either. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And I mean, it, it, it does make sense. There is also something I've heard about and I don't know. Well, I know some of this is true. There is a hypothesis that there is an inbuilt vertebrate response to something much smaller than you charging at you with no apparent fear that is an intrinsic like alarm or startle response it's something's been wrong. it's been suggested to be why people are afraid of spiders um because like spiders will move to and like other insects that move fast toward you like yeah that sounds like evo psych which is all made up so <laughs> well well but it's also like apparently it's an like apparently it's an actual phenomenon that elephants are afraid mm -hmm. of mice like if yeah. they see like it is okay. It oh is, yeah. Like rather, what I'm saying is, it's not a rational fear. Like human beings are afraid of like spiders that can't really hurt them. There are spiders that can hurt them. So like, to be clear, but they're afraid of spiders that can't hurt them. Most humans are afraid of cockroaches, um, little beetles, house centipedes, like th these little things that are not really that dangerous. Mice, l like tiny lizards. I got freaked out the other day. I was I was CT scanning a specimen that I will not name. Uh, at Duke University a few weeks ago. And I was sitting out like in the sun because it was a sunny day and I was waiting for my scan to go so I didn't need to be in the CT lab. And um, there was like a little, I think it was a green and all, like just appeared next to me. Mm -hmm. And like, I like lizards. Like, I, like I, I don't, I'm not afraid of them in any regard. But I saw the lizard like walk up to me and I was like, <laughs> like, uh, you know. <laughs> you're startled, yeah. Right, you're startled, right. And so what I'm saying is that there's not a rationality behind what, animals are afraid of um like the t-rex isn't thinking like my bite force could crush a stack of eight thousands of these <laughs> it, it is you know it's if i if i breathe on it too hard its bones will shatter and it'll just flop like a, <laughs> like a marionette with the strings cut right um it is it's like you know it's not thinking about that it's not aware of how much stronger it is or something it's just like there there's a thing buzzing me and it's making me frightened yeah. Um, you know, I Leave thought like, it would have been cool if the Troodontids ran up to the T-Rex and it got like startled and afraid. I'm sure that that kind of thing happened. Even if it was just like a little spook, like mm -hmm. literally <laughs> just now my cat went to scratch her post and somehow managed to give herself a spook. <laughs> There's nothing else happening in this apartment right now. Truly an um, intelligent animal. But yeah, like, yeah, I know we got big brain energy over here. <laughs> Oh my god. Anyway, I'm so sorry. Then, anyway, yeah. So then what segment came next? Next Bubble Boy. Is... Swim yeah. Swim. Bubble Boy. I love Bubble Boy. Uh Bubble Boy is great. Do you want uh, to say what Bubble, Bubble Boy, Boy is? is <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I was gonna get there. I'm not stupid, James. Thank you. Whoa, guys, come on. Let's we're hey, all friends here. Hey. <laughs> yeah, come on, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Um, I call Globidin's bubble boy because of its teeth, which are horrible bubbles. Um, so they kind of try to show it by have it by having it unnaturally open its mouth for no reason a couple times. Um, whoops. Need to tell David to be quiet. Um, I'm watching it right now. Um, so Globidin's, I think, is in my opinion, the best Mosasaur in the series. Um, because it to me, it just it moves a bit more naturally. It looks very great. And then they actually give it like this cool scene showing again, like more diversity in, in behavior and feeding strategy. Um, and yeah, so I've got it's right now. It's kind of trying to open its mouth to show off its its bubble teeth. So by bubble teeth, I mean they're like swollen and inflated and round instead of like a normal pointy tooth, which most other mosasaurs have. Um, the neat thing is that not all its teeth are bubbles. It's only the back teeth. Uh, and so the reason they probably have these teeth is to help them smash open hard-shelled prey items like ammonites and clams and things. Um, in this segment, they choose to show it biting the ammonites to, like, mess with their buoyancy, uh, which is... Oh, right, sorry, I'm watching it right now, and I was reminded of a scene that I was hoping would include globidins which is it shifts it shifts to like a night camera briefly and i was like oh we're gonna have night hunt and then it shifts away and i'm like oh sad <laughs> uh anyways um so 
we have found ammonite shells, lots and lots of ammonite shells that seem to have these punctures in them that seem to line up with like the spacing of teeth of mosasaurs. Um, while, and there's a lot of debate about this because the other reason that these holes could be present is that uh, other invertebrates like limpets, I think they're called, could be living on the shells and like boring into them. Mm-hmm. So they might not actually be tooth punctures. Uh, and if they are tooth punctures, they might not actually be from globidins. Um, and that's kind of where I'm leaning. Uh, so the reason for that is, oh my God, he's doing the tongue flick. God, what a good boy. I'm sorry. Really Anyways, good tongue um, on it too. You're like, oh my God. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so we were talking, I think, in the ocean episode about how there's a little bit of debate about what a Moses or tongue would look like. And they kind of nail it here. It's like, yeah, it's it is it's a lizard tongue, but it's not like a snake tongue. Um, and it is four. Uh anyway, so where was like, oh yes. Um, I don't know that Globidins was causing the punctures that we find in these ammonites because one, the bubble teeth would not, I don't think. No, the bubble teeth would not puncture like that. Mm-hmm. So the bubble teeth start. Oh man, I'm trying to remember. So the the teeth at the front of the skull are actually normal and pointed, and they shift into the bubble teeth towards the back. And the shift happens. I want to say, and I hope I don't get this wrong. At least on the lower jaw, around the fourth tooth position, and I think back. And so the teeth have points on them, but the points are really small and in the center of the tooth. And the holes that we find on the ammonites are they look like what you would expect from a normal shaped tooth, like it's a big round hole. And that big round hole is bigger than the point on the bubble teeth. The other thing is that Globidens has some of the most wicked jaw muscle ap- adaptations I've ever seen in a lizard. Uh, they've got these huge muscle attachment sites on the backs of their jaws, their ear bones, which also are part of their um part of their jaw. Technically, they connect the jaw to the, the skull. Um, are in this kind of weird round shape that I don't I don't entirely understand the musculature that's going on back there, but my suspicion is that because it's not just globidins that has it, it's other species with high bite force adaptations. Um, my what I'm getting at here is that is that if globidins bit into an ammonite, it would shatter into a million pieces. <laughs> and I believe this has actually been replicated with like a robot globidins at some point in time with nautilus shells i can't remember who told me this story someone told me that i might it might have been mike polson told me that at one point in time someone did make a globidins robot and they gave it a nautilus shell that they just bought online and it obliterated it um obviously this is not a very scientific test but like this thing is built to smash and not poke um so while it's possible that a mosasaur may have been making those pokes like maybe a, a platycarpus or something because they are suspiciously lined up. Uh, I don't think it was Globidens. I think Globidens was smashing them to pieces and then eating the soft parts. Or or maybe not eating ammonites. I don't know. It was Maybe it was eating clams instead. Yes, Alec? No, you answered my I was I was curious. So if it, like, what, what do you think Globidens was eating? But she adds my question. I think, yeah, I think it was eating clams, like, because the other thing is that because the bubble teeth are concentrated at the back of the jaw, too. So, like, it's like, why, if you're going to poke the holes with the front teeth and then pull the soft part out, why would you even have big teeth in the back? You know, it's, I don't, I don't know. I don't entirely so, understand, like, the, all, like if you, if you have comments. Would there have been those big Rudus bivalves still? I believe so. Yeah, well, Globidens is known from the seaway as well, so. Okay. So yeah. Those were tasty uh, and, like, crunchy and good, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, the other thing is, like, like I said, like, the teeth up front are kind of normal. And by normal, I I mean, like, pointed, and they kind of point forward a little bit. And also, the sensory pits on the front of their face are huge. Like, they're insane. A lot of, like, most sorts of very sensitive faces. Globidins, in particular, has a lot of, like, really, really prominent sensory pits on the front of its snout. And so, kind of, what I think is going on is he's, they're probably digging around in the mud with their faces, and digging oh, okay. up digging up hmm. snails and clams and things like that and then they would work them to the back of the jaws obliterate them so in terms of like the, the pits are they densely packed like a gator no they're big like okay. there's more of them 
Like the th- the things that st- so I worked on the the holotype at Globidens Dakotensis or Dakota Ensis, however you want to pronounce it, at the Field Museum, which is like the best Globidin skull in North America. Uh, we have a couple of good ones from Morocco, not many from North America. In North America, it's a lot of isolated teeth. Uh, anyway, so that that boy, I what stood out to me is that there was a higher concentration of them on the snout and on mm. like specifically like anterior, so front maxilla. And the ones on the front maxilla were so big that I could almost stick a finger in it, which is absurd. Like for usually mosasaur foramina on like those sensory foramina on the, I'm sorry, foramina are the holes in the face, the sensory pits. The pits are usually not that big. They're usually, I don't know, a quarter the size, the, a quarter the diameter of like a dime. I don't know. I'm being like smaller than a pencil. They're little. They're yeah. little. They're like if you poked a hole with a pencil. These ones were big enough that you could stick the eraser side of the pencil into them hmm. or like a small finger. Yeah. And it really stood out to me. No, I mean, it sounds uh, like they're so, carrying some huge nerve. Like, yeah. Yeah, because that's analogous Good. to what yeah. mammals, some, with, with, mammals with whiskers do. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, they have some. Yeah. That's, that's good. But like, like animals with very sensitive noses um, or like whisker, app- uh, whisker apparatuses. Yeah. Tend to have a huge so mammals it reorganizes so it's not as branched a nerve. There's one huge exit from the jaw. It's the infraorbital foramen, um, which like we have, it it goes right here and it carries the nerve that does sensation and innervation through the face. And in animals with whiskers, it can be like a big ass window. I have a dumb mammal question. Sure. Yeah. Is that what that huge huge hole like in the front of rodent? Faces yeah. for yeah. Well, okay. so in rodent faces, yeah, yeah. also remember that that area gets excavated by the masseter because the masseter moves off the zygomatic arch and forward, so it excavates okay. the, the anterior oh. region of the skull. Yeah, wow. rodent, okay. rodents. Oh, I'm are... stupid. If we want a visual aid, I do have a hyena skull I could show it on. That's a rodent. Hyenas are rodent. No, no, it's not <laughs> rodent. I'm just saying, like it has. I can see I the foramen. I'll here, flash but... an image on screen because flash you, images, you, yeah, because you're, you're the really rodent small. one is absurd. Yeah, rodents are weird, but yeah, all mammals reorganize the trigeminal like that, mm-hmm. so that the trigeminal nerve is exiting that way. This is very funny because it reminds me of my favorite question that I've ever been asked in a talk, which is I was talking about sensory pits and mosasaurs, and a ki- it was a kids a kids talk, and one of the kids asked me if that meant they had whiskers and i said no and <laughs> surprise globidens has whisk no um but yeah no that's that's that's, that's cool. an insightful question that is yeah no that, I, oh yeah i love smart kids kid. questions are great yeah i would be no careful. where was so, sorry no i'm trying to think the insightful questions i got it was like when things go extinct or no when 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 things fossilize where does the bone go and I was like, it turns to stone. And she's like, yeah, but where does it go? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. What do you mean? For Globidin's teeth, I would hesitate about the robots studies because those are oh, yeah. often like really flawed because they ignore the fact that the real animal is not made of steel actuated by a car motor. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and also the Nautilus shell. Like, I actually don't know what Nautilus shell does when the animal dies but generally these tissues wind yeah. up a little bit more brittle after like the, they're no longer in a living animal mm-hmm. like the material properties of yeah. bone as an isolated thing in a dead thing is not quite what the material properties of bone are like in a living animal because it's, yeah. a, it's a living tissue yeah and that's why i tried to say like to take it with a grain of salt because yeah. like and and so you're you are like james is elaborating on what i really meant which is like this is or i said what did i, I said it's not really a scientific study yeah, because mm-hmm. they're like, let's build a robot and break a shell, which is like fun, but not really yeah. controlling for all of these, you know, complicated yeah. things. But, but I think, was, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, it, I mean, it bears out even like in non desiccated, like if you're having crab legs, right? Like you're you're eating, and it's chitin, not mother of pearl, but like right when you use your like crackers and your clackers, like they don't break in a, in a nice orderly like way. It just this these materials tend to just shatter. Yeah. No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, 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 uh, but, exactly. But what I was going to say about the Globidin's teeth is I don't think that it is impossible that puncture, that I don't think that they would necessarily shatter ammonite just based on, like, the breakage pattern on those materials. Like, these materials have natural crack stoppers and everything. It would require, we'd have to know a lot about the bite force exactly as it performs, but I think that, like, normal Mosasaur teeth would probably have a difficult time puncturing an ammonite shell 
just based on what I know about the material properties of them. I think the largest Tylosaurus could probably get enough force to do it, but it is not a good tool yeah. to do that. Um, right. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, and like, this is this why I'm wondering about like. I went blurry this time. Ooh. 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 Nice. Spice it up. Um, so so the, the thing or the issue I have with like the bite marks on Mosasaur shells is that there is no cracking. Mosasaur shell? And like I said, they're <laughs> no, Hello Mosasaur. viewers, it is 1233 a.m. <laughs> um anyways, uh the 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 ammonite shells like around the punctures don't have any breakage, which I think is odd. And like again. The size of the punctures does not line up like it's a pinprick on the globidin's teeth. Like the point, if they like, so like mechanically, if you're applying like pressure on that tiny point, like you're, it, I, I'm envisioning that it would kind of smash, it would crush. There is no crushing around these punctures, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I mean, it's sorry, I, I was imagining something was, with crushing. Yeah, there's no crushing. No, around. I'm. No. 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 Special. No. So we'll find we'll find pictures. That's the weird thing. Mm -hmm. I'm of the opinion we can keep off the record that they are they're yeah. borings from invertebrates and not mosasaurs at all because that's, I don't see a way I of biting these shells and creating this kind of a, a pattern. No, Which and that's like when I when story. I inter when I yeah there it's like it it looks carved. What I interviewed here, my, the first person I talked to was Neil Landman, and that's the first thing he asked me. He's like, I got a I got an ammonite here. Did a mosasaur bite it? I'm like, I don't think so. He's like, right, I don't think so either. I think it's a little bit. I'm like, okay. Like, no, it's, they're clean. They're clean holes. I was going to say, like, even a, even a Mosasaur tooth would create crushing. Like, there's no way you can get an animal to, like, do a clean hole through that. Um, yeah. Unless you're, like, shooting it with a rail gun. <laughs> I, yeah, or, like, the, the thing, the reason I specifically said, like, apply applied carpines is because they have, like, really long, they have long skinny teeth. So I was just mm. thinking of, like, what could make a hole that is clean like that? Like, maybe if it's just, but I, I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, just like, the I material don't... properties, it's something that would shatter. It's like, it, it's like even if you have a really yeah, fine, fine hammer tip, if you, like, slam it on a plate, you're never going to, like, go right through the plate and not shatter yeah. it around it. Yeah. So if there's no shattering at all, it's, yeah. no, it's probably got to be limpets. That's, yeah, that, that's a good, a good analogy is hitting it's a plate. A like, even if you hit a plate right. with a nail. If you hit a plate mm -hmm. with a nail, if you hit a plate with a hammer, it doesn't matter. It's going to, it's going to crack. Right. It's, you're not going to get a clean break. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so this is of course not the fault prehistoric planet because like that is the only hypothesis that's really been proposed right now. And um, we know Globin is not, eating ammonites. And we, we know, know, well, no, well, but we, we don't know. Here's the problem, right? Is we don't know. Um, and what would really seal it is if we found like ammonite beaks inside of one. Like that's kind of really what we need. And we don't find ammonite beaks inside of any mosasaur. Do we find ammonite so, beaks at all? Rarely. Or not. I, it's either the beaks or it's like those little, the little. Um, the aptikai? Like, what am I thinking? They're like operculum. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 Sorry. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of that. Uh, the point is, we okay. don't find ammonite shells or beaks or parts inside of mosasaurs. So, given that we have gut contents from a Tylosaurus that has like everything else, yeah. it's kind of there's that that South mm -hmm. Dakota School of Mines ones. It's like here's a bird and a platycarpus and three fish and a plesiosaur. And it's like okay, so we know they were eating everything, but not invertebrates. We've got, I think, a platycarping that's full of um, belemnites, which are they're the they're, I don't know what they are, but they're from squid. Um, they're not squid. Like, they're not squid. They look like squids. Don't they look like squids? Or am they I do. thinking of something else? They do, they do look like squids, do look like like squids okay. but they aren't squid. What are they okay. actually? Their their true clade is escaping me. I know they're a different radiation. Um, hold on. Let me find out. See if they're coleoids. Oh, okay. fuck. Why is this not Wikipedia? But anyway, like the the point is just that we we have mosasaur gut contents, and none of them include ammonites, which is kind of bizarre. Not to say they weren't eating them; they probably were. It's just we really actually don't have direct evidence of it, especially if you're of the opinion that the holes in the ammonites aren't mosasaur bites. So okay, I mean, so they are coleoids. Okay, but so, they're not squid. So I mean, um, like 
honestly what prehistoric planet is showing in terms of the way they're like just ripping the soft animal out of the animal yeah. shell like yeah. that would be the way to feed on them that minimizes the amount of hard tissue that you'd find and seems to kind of like be something yeah. that a mosasaur could do quite easily with the force like the force of their body like just yeah. grab and eat and it's gonna like that animal's gonna come out and then yeah you know, especially you, like, like there's a little bit there but it's it's small stuff that could evade detection i imagine or yeah. or be dissolved yeah. no, easily by stomach acid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, uh, again, don't... it's not impossible, but we don't have globidens gut contents either, right? Like we don't even have a full no. skeleton of a globidens, do we? There's one. There's okay. one near complete skeleton, uh Globidens Shermani. Mm. It's in it's in South Dakota. It's in the collections oh, cool. of the school of mines. Mm. Uh it's got a single paper and the pictures were taken a long time ago, and there's no contrast. And I know this because I had to sc- score it from the paper and it mm. was was bad <laughs> it's bad it's bad i mean which is a shame because it is basically the only globidin skeleton that we have like most of what we know of globidins is from teeth especially in north america um and north america mastrichtian i think they're i i'm not sure if they're from elsewhere but the mastrichtian ones i know about there's three isolated teeth at the new jersey state museum that are globidins but other than that, we really don't have much, which is sad because it is cool. And I like it. It wouldn't be surprising if they were maybe more pelagic that like they were tending to like, especially if they were eating ammonites in particular, like they might be spending way more time out in the open ocean than other. No, mosasaurs. because we find a lot of ammonites like the, the seaway That's is true. pelagic. The middle of like Kansas is pelagic and Kansas. I think there's one denary. Yeah. of a globidin mm. but a couple of teeth and we don't find them up in the bear paw either up in canada like they're finding complete mm. mosasaurs left and right at the terrell museum and none of them no no globidins yet i really really hope they find one though yeah well anyway this is interesting but we should talk about pectinodon now because we're, we've are we been recording for 40 minutes and we've gone through two <laughs> out of five segments um, oh dear because bubble boy is great so there's a there's a segment that happens near what's supposed to be an evaporating lake um it's a neat idea it's the, yeah. you know the, almost certainly there were evaporating lakes at the time right i mean and it's a beautiful landscape really really dramatic uh salt precipitate deposits which is you know this is the thing that happens when lakes evaporate all the minerals start precipitating out and you get They're these really evaporites right right yeah and they are cool rock formation and so in this yeah, salty right. salty lake uh there are a a glut, uh, a proliferation of fly. Um, what was the what was the line about the king of England who died because he ate too many lampreys? What the fuck are you talking about? Anyway, <laughs> um, oh yes, I'm sorry. It is a it, he. He was said to have eaten a surfeit of or a surfee of lampreys. Um, anyway, there's a lot of th- this is going nowhere. So there's a lot of flies in the sure. salty lake, um, and that's bringing birdie dinosaurs there. One of them is a true bird, uh, Presby ornithine, um, which is what was the genus again? Oh, Stigenetta. I... Yes, yeah, Stigenetta. Mm-hmm. Right, which is not officially named yet. Um, it seems to be based on what we've heard. It seems to have been named in a PhD dissertation where maybe I don't know who's. P- Whose dissertation? I don't know is. who's. It's possible it's somebody who's left the field and they're not really intending to pursue it, and so these things are just languishing. Um, so it hasn't been officially named, but it's known from the latest Cretaceous of North America. But hunting Stigenetta is Pectinodon baccarai. Well, also we should probably say what a presbyornithine is. Oh, I don't know what it is. That's why I didn't say it. It's a bird. <laughs> it's it's a it's a stem. It's a galloanceriform. Yeah. Oh, they are gallo and seriforms. They're that they high are. up the tree. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's a crown bird. Right. So this is a this is a member of the living group of birds, and it is it's a stem gallo and seriform. So it's a member of the lineage that leads to ducks and chickens. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. I think it actually and might screamers. be a stem and serif. Like, hold on. Let me. Well, so I I saw that Albert Chen tweeted a uh, a phylogeny that like at, at one point they were thought to be on the stem of like on the stem of geese and chickens to the exclusion of screamers but now okay. it looks like they might actually just be on the stem of all gallo and seriforms so i see right so i mean they're they're pretty derived bird um, yes 
But I'm more interested in the animal that's hunting them, which is Pectinodon. Um, Pectinodon is a troodontid. It is known from teeth. There might be a fragment of maxilla or dentary, but I don't think there even is. So if it's known from teeth, it's probably a troodontid. <laughs> Right. Because there are some ID issues. Yes, there are. I mean, the genus Troodon in particular is potentially on its way out. Um, the, the, the holotype of Troodon is a single tooth. Um, troodontid teeth are highly characteristic, but they are not diagnostic for species. They're diagnostic of the group. Um, derived also, troodontids like that all have the same tooth morphology. Well, isn't there a certain issue with the group of ornithischians? Well, yes, with Pachycephalosaurus, <laughs> right? Where yeah, yeah, pachycephalosaur teeth also resemble those, so it's possible that the troodon tooth comes from that. Troodon was considered a pachycephalosaur for a while. It's it's weird. Um, the taxonomic history is tortured. I refuse to go into it here. <laughs> we will make a video about troodon, at least one video about troodon, given that it's in Jurassic it's in World. Game. Yeah, yeah. So let's stick a pin in the troodon issue. Here's what I do know. Um, it, it has been called, or I'm sorry, it has been proposed that we restrict what we generally consider Troodon to the genus uh, Stenonychosaurus. This would encompass the remains from the Dinosaur Park formation in Canada. Um, however, there's a bunch of material from Montana from the Two Medicine formation, which is a similar age, that has always been called Troodon. And I know that that's in the process of being redescribed, and it is possible that that will become a neotype of Troodon. Yeah. And so the name Troodon will be anchored to that. Um, in be any cool. case, Pactinodon is known from almost nothing. Um, it's a very, very poorly known thing. The appearance here is mostly based on the Mongolian Troodontid Xanabazar, which is what I thought this was going to be, because there's also Presbyornithines from Mongolia, mm. and Xanabazar is from the Nemet Formation, which is the right age for the show. Um, but it's not Xanabazar. The baby Troodontids look great. I liked how they were so cute. They were ram feeding, just running into the (laughs) cloud of flies, just like a basking shark. Um, Real, real future is wild hours. (laughs) Yeah, they were cookies and cream colored. They were great. They they were beautiful. Um, I don't love the design of the adult pectinodon. I don't like the weird feather mohawk thing. Oh, looks it looks like a man, and that bothers me. Yeah, it looks a little goofy. (laughs) Um, but it's just. (laughs) It's fine. It, it's not inaccurate. I just don't love the final design for it, but it's okay. Um, it's a cool segment. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the birds look really good. I they forget did. what they're called, but they, they look like a weird flamingo, but not really. But just like, I like, kind of like, I like the color. I like the way they move. And just kind of were weird. Right. And I mean, it's it's worth people knowing that like, not only like, Birds during the Mesozoic weren't all primitive toothed birds. Like, crown birds had evolved. Um, by this stage, yeah. By this stage. I mean, they, they show up pretty late, but they're there. Um, you know, a lot of groups of birds saw the, saw the asteroid fall. Probably not, because it probably happened incredibly fast. Yeah, they probably didn't see <laughs> so, anything. They are probably like, why is the air so hot? <laughs> Where did my skin go? <laughs> um... That's all I really have to say about the lake. It, it, it's neat. Um, okay. It's neat. But you know what's after the lake? My favorite segment oh, of the whole season. Uh, yeah, my favorite segment of the whole show, maybe. I won't say that, but I would say my favorite segment of the episode, no doubt. For sure. Well, I mean, I guess my favorite segment has to be Kurukula and Karitha Raptor, but my god, the Triceratops mating grounds. Were- Let's talk so- about the Chads. Oh my god. Incredible. Versus the virgin. The bigger chads. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, man, I do like ceratopsians quite, quite a bit. And this helped with that a lot. What I really liked is, like, even before the fight started, that, that younger male ceratopsian, or ceratopsian, the younger male triceratops, was doing, like, a weird, like, not a weird, but a, a kind of very subtle mating display where he was, like, rocking back and forth a little bit and waving his head back but slowly and kind mm-hmm. of vibrating with this low grumble that i didn't even pick up on when we watched it for the first time because it was streaming amelia's audio and mm-hmm. you know through zoom you get a little bit of degradation i watched it again today mm-hmm. and i was just like the the almost infrasound of the 
Ceratopsian rumbling. Man. Well, that's in keeping with ideas about low frequency sound in dinosaurs, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it seems very. And like reasonable. this entire, this entire scene, like I, I have it running on the side here. Um, the way the way they kind of are swaying around, and even the ones that are just kind of watching it, reminds me very, very much of like elephants. Like they'll kind of sway sometimes, and that, and they and they also communicate mostly through like infrasound. Right. That's yeah. so cool. And and keeping it loose. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, it's a yoga pose. Um, <laughs> and it, it's worth also noting that modern archosaurs, like early diverging birds and crocodilians, also generally use very low frequency rumbling in courtship displays, um, in yeah. vocal displays in general. So, like, it's reasonable to assume that that's something pretty common throughout large bodied archosaurs. I would be surprised if very small bird like dinosaurs were doing that, but like, to imagine that that's a pretty general archosaur mm-hmm. thing is very reasonable. Um, I love the Triceratops design. It's 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 so good. Yeah. Um, but the but I mean, we should talk about the ten ton Ceratopsian in the room. Oh my god, he's so cool. <laughs> but I, I, so th- this we we've talked a little bit, and and one thing we've said a couple like. A few times about the show is that sometimes the show suffer not doesn't suffer. Right? That's a little exaggerated. Sometimes it's it's hard to gauge the scale of these things when it's only like a dinosaur in an environment, and you're like, I don't know how big this is. It helps that the ten ton Triceratops is so much bigger than the little the puny baby Triceratops he is going to fight. And and the other thing we we've, we've talked about is sometimes through again like not a, not a a fault of the show, but just kind of a fault of dealing with purely computer generated animals, right? Is that sometimes when they interact, it can feel a little bit weightless or it's hard to like assess that. Oh, like there's mass kind of colliding. And that's not the case here. Oh, this you feel is, like it. two huge animals, one like catastrophically larger than the other running at each <laughs> other at full tilt. And like, you feel it. And we even felt it through like the slightly degraded stream because again, I'm I'm so dissatisfied with Apple TV. <laughs> it it's just the the kinetic energy of it. I really I know I said this last night, and so I apologize for repeating myself for the third time for my friends. But for you, the viewer, this is the first time you've heard this. Um, there's a story about the whale ship Essex, which was rammed by a bull sperm whale, uh, who seemed to like just be kind of swimming near the ship. It was very weird. It was a oddly behaving sperm whale there is some thinking that it might have like known that it was a whaling ship and was taking revenge so it charged the ship and hit it prow on and the front of the ship basically just telescoped inward like this is what led to this is the movie in the heart of the sea it was one of the inspirations for the novel moby dick um most of the crew winds up dying and they start cannibalizing each other because they were adrift in the south pacific ocean out like really really far away from any land and having no idea where they were a few of them made it back to Nantucket. It's a very wow. cool story. Um, I was expecting, and like I, I shouldn't have expected this because this is not the kind of show prehistoric planet is. But like, okay. For those of you who watch like any fighting sports, I don't, but like I know this. Boxing classes, weight classes, are like ranges of seven pounds. Because that's what's considered like fair for a fight, is that you've got to be basically the same size. Because if you're in a physical confrontation with an animal or another person, the absolute physical size of the person matters a lot, even if they're not that good at fighting. Like, a, a heavier or taller person will almost invariably destroy somebody who's smaller, unless the like heavier, taller person is extremely incompetent, or the smaller person is like a Navy SEAL. The, so boxing weight classes are a seven-pound difference. They say in the narration that this bull triceratops weighs four tons more than the small one. I was expecting for them to hit each other, for the skull of the little triceratops to just split down the middle, (laughs) and for the vertebral column to just go like, shoop, like a slinky dog being folded up. Just blood everywhere, just like this cracking sound and the dinosaur just like falling like Mr. Krabs into multiple pieces. In that episode of Spongebob. I, yeah. I wanted it I wasn't so expecting, badly. 
I wasn't expecting quite that, but I wasn't expecting it to like not last long at all. Like I thought it was just going to go and then like throw him to the ground immediately. And like at the part where like there's a moment where like it slips its horns like just right under the little one where I'm like, oh, he's going to break his neck. And then he doesn't. I'm like, well, he probably could have. Or the other thing I was envisioning is like, oh, it probably it's big enough. And it's one horn is like different than the other. I'm like, if you get the right angle on that, you could have like a horror situation, like when deers get their antlers locked together and one of them gets its head ripped off. I thought I'm not too seriously, because again, it's the kind of show it is. I thought we might get a, if not a decapitation, there was a point where the angle of the horns, like, I'm like, holy, is this thing going to like ram its weird asymmetrical one through its throat? Oh, yeah. Or I was. Yeah. There's a point where the the bigger one is kind of lifting the little one up with its head, like just lifting it up by the head. I thought yeah. that the big one's nose horn was going to go into like the oh, nasal yeah. cavity, like all the soft tissue kind of in Triceratops' big huge nares. It didn't end up happening and yeah, I don't blame the show for not having it do that. But like there are so many I don't want to say missed opportunities for violence because I think this also it's not like they should have done it compared to what happened because it's so good. But like, just there, there were so many opportunities for violence because it's such a violent encounter. I just, I did not expect the small one to survive. I really didn't. It, no. It's so outclassed in terms of weight. Like, this wasn't a slightly larger male. If the large male is stated to weigh ten tons and it's supposed to be four tons more than the little one, the little one weighs six tons. The large male is almost twice as large. No, no, no. You are the soy wojack. I am the. Right. <laughs> this would be like if you're a four foot ten man in a bagel store uh, <laughs> who asks if somebody wants to go outside and fight and, and then being surprised that you were utterly destroyed and humiliated in that bagel store. <laughs> this this would be the like that. Of Long Island. Yes. <laughs> this is a very, very important oral... story in Long Island folklore. It's part of our oral tradition. <laughs> um it just uh, a stunning segment. I don't. I I will say I don't know if it's quite literally my favorite in the show. Um, I really liked a lot of the Badlands episode, and in terms of animal fights, I might have even preferred Pachycephalosaurus slightly. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, I don't. I may have exaggerated. It's certainly my favorite of the episode. It was, and it's up there for the show. But if, I think it, it was. Might be it was the coolest. I like. I didn't find the Pachycephalosaurus fight cool. I found it very compelling. Hmm. More. I, this was just a very cool thing. Like, and this is maybe my summary of Prehistoric Planet Season 2 is it dared to be cooler than Season 1. I, yes. And I was happy yeah. about that. Um, season 1 did a lot of trying to subvert expectations and show animals in context that we're not used to. And that's good. But what's better is doing that and also making it fucking cool. <laughs> and, and they really did that here in many of the segments also a very clear pterosaur bias in the show at no point was a pterosaur hit by i don't know just an animal doing that a little bit and flying to a million pieces yeah just like the other thing i'll say disintegrating at the end of the last harry potter movie (laughs) the other thing i'll say from my perspective of all of us watching this together um there was a lot more more engagement from the gallery with this fight like the the sounds the three of you were making as the fight was occurring, very entertaining. The commentary the whole time. It was really, it, was it, it made it more fun. It was great. And it was like, it was, yeah, it was fun to watch. I didn't really know how they were going to handle it because like, again, as we said, knowing that it's not a violent show, it was like, okay, how are they going to make this not violent and still exciting? I remember saying oh. Chad a lot. I remember oh, yeah. saying <laughs> uh, Twink Triceratops a few times. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, Stunning. His horns have no scratches on them. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. <laughs> He's also got. Sorry to kind of interrupt. The bigger one I noticed when we were watching it. Not only is the one horn like different from the other, but he's got like a divot in the back of its frill, and yeah. I wonder if it's meant to be a bite mark from a rex or if it's a like a horn injury. Mm. I, I would have liked a little bit more backstory on this, like, ancient grizzled warrior of Triceratops. Yeah. Like, like just David Attenborough's narration, it's like, he's killed five T-Rex. <laughs> like, just, just like, well, talk I think about, it's make also him like, like the f- John Wick. He's killed ten men, somehow. <laughs> yeah. 
You know what they should have done? They should have had a come had him enter the scene with blood dripping off his horns. <laughs> At the the decapitated tyrannosaur on just on his horns, he's gotta shake off before he fights. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He just walks in yeah. and is like, while well, you were trying to impress female triceratops, I was studying the blade. <laughs> no, he's the Chad. He wouldn't say that. That's what cringe virgins That's say. True. That's, that is true. <laughs> yeah. Um God, what a cool segment. The the little the the, the virgin triceratops. My horns are uh, made of keratin folded a million times. <laughs> T- tips frill, milady, and then just bah! <laughs> <laughs> My frill bone has been remodeled over a thousand times. <laughs> the other guy's origin story is I pushed a tire from one end of the room to another end of the room for three months. <laughs> and now I can bend the steel. <laughs> and that's um, the one who wins the fight. Yeah, it sure is. Um, but then because the last this is segment, a real world, and was, weight class is important. Right. Well, that's why I'm amazed it was even a fight. I was expecting for the like the big one to not get pushed back at all. Like it doesn't know it's been hit. <laughs> There's like a weird, and I I don't want to get too much into like fighting and stuff. There's like a weirdness, like just because someone is big and strong and muscly does not mean they're also not incredibly fast. Right. Like those muscles still move fast. Just because someone is smaller, it's like, well, he's smaller. He has speed on his side. I'm like, no, not really. Not really. Like maybe like he's a little more agile or live, but like, no. And, like, listen, listen, would I, like, a small guy who's really well-trained in fighting, would I take him over an average bigger guy? Yeah, uh, although I don't know how big I'd give that. Okay, so last segment in the entire season, and hopefully not the entire show, because I think it would be good if there's more seasons of this. Especially if we're going to put us in it. Yeah. (laughs) Please. Please put us in it. I can help you do an entire episode on lizards. Oh, that would be great. Of the land. Um, but the last segment of this episode was Nanoxorus. It's what's actually on this splash image that I have as the default for these videos. Um, a Nanoxorus hunting for her babies. And she's hunting the fastest dinosaur that she possibly can. Um, it's an Ornithomimus. Right. Um, which have which the did... stupid mohawk haircut. I love look... it. Well, I thought about it and they made him look like, like a greaser. Yeah. He's like, they're going to come out snapping? They're like they're a gotta gang. Go fast. <laughs> they're gotta, the get gang my, gotta get on my motorcycle, daddy-o. Yeah, they're the Jets. Yes. But, um, yeah, it's a, I thought that the last segment was shot beautifully. Yeah. Um, there are, like, compositing things is hard and getting the lighting right is hard. But I've noticed that, in general, the polar segments really seem to just integrate yeah. the animals in a way where, like, I don't feel like there's a single shot where you start to see the illusion break down. I mean, well, there's the angiosperm in the room, but like... You mean the grass? Yeah, but <laughs> I, once, once, I, once I was kind of like, all right, well, there's going to be grass, and then I didn't care because it looked good. Yeah. No, I mean, this is, for viewers who might be confused about that, um, we now know grass had evolved by the latest Cretaceous, but the rise of grasslands in this sort of context does not happen until uh, the later part right. of the Cenozoic. So, yes, grasses a clade existed, um, but you wouldn't see large expanses of grasses like this right. at that no. point. It's worth keeping in mind, grasses are incredibly diverse. I think palm trees are technically a grass, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It depends on what you define as grass, yeah. Okay. Bamboo. The, the, other, the other thing Bamboo's that's, grass. Yeah. that's worth thinking about, though, is that to film on location, basically anywhere on Earth, it's, it's yep. almost impossible to not contend with grasses. So, like... There's, right, right. there's just nothing that they could do well, if yeah. they wanted to get the on-location shots, which they desperately did because it looks so good. Yeah, no, I mean, it's the right... I wouldn't even call it a sacrifice because, like, for most people, they're not even going to think about it. Like, we are so used to the ubiquity of grass, but that is a very recent phenomenon in Earth's history. Um, and there's they did something... a good job of not finding many grass-dominated areas, but th- mm-hmm. there's some that they that you just have to. Like, that's why they filmed a lot of Walking with Dinosaurs and, like, the volcanic hellscape that they made to be the Hell Creek formation. <laughs> you know, they're like, well, there's no grass there. It's like, yeah, there's not, there's no trees. There's nothing alive. It, it, there is you're something in the middle to say, of the like, Andes. 
there's something to be said for like when you encounter when when you're out in like an environment like per, like you that and there's not grass around it's i always odd. I, it's odd but it's like it's like i feel like i'm somewhere like in a different time yeah like, like, like pine forest where just the entire forest floor is ferns stuff like that it slaps it may, it's yeah. cool the outside is cool and it's nice don't cut down for us. I like for us. Yeah. If you get a chance to get a chance to like hike up in like some montane areas or especially in like the Pacific, Pacific Northwest, Northwest, right? Yeah. You get you get kind of the best of that. Like anywhere where there's like dense conifer forests. If you get dense enough yeah. into the forest, you you really Any- start to feel out of place. Yeah, yeah. So Pacific Northwest and some at some like northern parts of the Midwest also. Like I, I can think of a couple places back home that yeah, it's exactly that. It's like it's like cedar forests. So there's like this when you're walking you're walking on like layers of just like cedar needles yeah mm-hmm. and there's yeah, ferns and mosses and it's oh god it's so it's a wonderful wonderful environment deep new england woods also feel very old i was i was gonna say like even up in vermont where where my family used to spend a lot of time like there was one hiking trail we do a lot and right off the mm-hmm. trail it was just it was all ferns so it was like conifer trees although some some deciduous trees as well and just ferns everywhere i actually see if i can find it i shot like a video with some of my friends up there when i was in high school and i got these beautiful shots of one of my friends just like walking through the ferns up there uh just like dappled light and everything but again it just it didn't feel like the current geologic Mm -hmm. time it i felt like i was in the cretaceous or something i don't Um, take videos or photographs in places of deep deep nature like that because i have a wild unfounded fear of looking through the video or photo and seeing something at the edge of the trees <laughs> i was gonna say yeah i don't either because it never actually captures it and it's just disappointing but sure you do you man <laughs> yeah well i mean i had to make a video for a high school assignment and like we were like there's a beautiful yeah. spot here i wasn't gonna not do it but it was like no no no. i'm not let me to be clear i'm making fun of alex for thinking oh, that I ghosts see. are real got it, got it, got it. i don't no, think ghosts like, are real he knows whatever. they're real ghosts aren't real Implaceable things at the edge of your vision, though, those are real. You're very clearly someone has never had a sleep paralysis demon before. So, you know. <laughs> so, anyway, so this is a really good segment. Um, <laughs> we love about it, so it's, Yeah, yeah it's, 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 I but, uh, not on ironic, not ironically. I do. It's great. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great, it's a great segment. It, it's beautifully rendered and, and shot. Um, I love also like. This is the Tyrannosaur nerd in me, but there are two groups of Solarosaurs that are really well adapted for speed. Well, there's three. Troodontids are also part of it. But Tyrannosaurs and Ornithomimosaurs share... What are you going for? Um, the Legear Alvarosaurs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me put it this way. Two early diverging groups of Solarosaurs are well adapted <laughs> for speed. And Tyrannosaurs and Ornithomimosaurs share so many features in the hindlimb skeleton that from isolated remains, it can be difficult to tell them apart. Um, yeah, like early on, they're, in, they're really similar. Early on, theropod phylogenetics, uh, Tom Holtz, when things were still being tracked, like everyone was trying to figure out their relationships, uh, there was some thought of the, this arcto metatarsus clade, which is where the, the metatarsals, the beat, the bones that are like the, your foot, the actual part of your foot, but the middle one gets pinched between yeah. the two and that's a feature that's found in a lot of running things like and it's found in tyrannosaurs and ornithomimosaurs mm-hmm. uh, and, and troodontids and i yes. think i think some alvarosaurs as well um i believe that's true yeah but i mean the pelvis also looks very similar in ornithomimosaurs and tyrannosaurs the pedal phalanges like just the whole leg yeah looks really similar when you look at like a juvenile tyrannosaur and a large ornithomimid like there's a lot of similarity and so I kind of liked getting to see tyrannosaurs as pursuit predators. I think there's something to be said for that maybe being their ancestral mode of predation. Like, we now know from fossils like Moros, um, which is basically just a hind limb from Utah uh, that was found by my postdoc advisor, Lindsay Zano, that, like, tyrannosaur limb proportions are the first thing to kind of go wild, even when they're still quite small. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's probably an argument to be made that they originate as fleet-footed pursuit predators. Like, if you if you think about other carnivores that are around at the time as like large bears, you could imagine tyrannosaurs kind of coming onto the scene as cheetahs. And then 
only then later on becoming very, very large, heavily built predators. They retain a lot right. of features associated with fast running, even though they start getting to sizes where running is impossible. T-Rex is just too big to run. It's not too big to walk, <laughs> but it's too big to run. Um, anyway, I enjoyed getting to see Nenoxaurus, which is a fairly modest-sized Tyrannosaur, as a pursuit predator, really going after fast animals in the ecosystem, and, like, successfully. Um, it's neat. Yeah. Bad to see a good ornithomimosaur eat it, but these things happen. Yeah. But it's good for the babies. It, and the babies are and now I know this, looking. Um, the ornithomimosaurs, they have these bright red, pinaceous forearm feathers. Mm-hmm. And that is kind of evocative of the art that was published with the first feathered ornithomimosaur. Well, not with the paper that was describing pinaceous forearm feathers. And I think we talk about this in our Struthiomimus video or Archaeonorthomimus video, but there's evidence of some kind of attachment for some kind of long feather on the forearms, whether they were like contoured flight feathers is unclear because we only have the attachment points. Um, They could have been more like emus, but the bright red colors kind of tie back to this hypothesis about why those feathers evolved, which was that they were some kind of these long feathers on the forearms were evolving for display feet, which I thought was a neat little detail. Yeah. No, I mean, the ornithomimus look great. I I don't love the way the mohawk looks. Um, I think it You're looks very silly. You're a hater, silly. bro. I it, really like it. It just, I mean, it just looks a little silly to me, but that's okay. Like, they, they were probably very silly-looking dinosaurs. Um, does that haterade replenish your electrolytes? It does. It's actually <laughs> okay, all that sustains me, Alex. You know that. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, that is the last episode of Prehistoric Planet Season 2. Um, yeah, we hope they make more. This is fun. We do. I think we'll do, when Scott's back in this country, I think we'll do a little retrospective on what we think the season did well overall, what we'd like to see from a Season 3, that sort of thing. Us. Um, yeah, well, yeah, that's the main <laughs> thing. Just us. A Kurukula episode, please. Um, <laughs> well, well, depending on when the uh, when the next episode comes out, we might have more than just Kurukula. Yeah, well, yeah. Watch the space. We are splitters. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we'll do some sort of retrospective episode where we really bring it all together and talk about what we all think of the show. But for now, these are our thoughts about each episode. Um, we will continue doing prehistoric planet on Earth episodes about the show in general so we'll deep dive into segments that warranted and have a lot of science to talk about um and we'll mix and match so we won't do all of season one before we do season two we'll do them kind of as we want to um you can let us know in the comments what segment you would like us to evaluate next we'll ignore it and do it kind of what we want but feel free to do that <laughs> yeah or maybe we'll do what you tell us who's to say there's only one way to find hey, out tell us if you've had a sleep paralysis demon uh draw it Put it in the comments. Tell us what yours looks like. We'll make a whole Have little. A we'll make a zoo of them. The skeleton crew demon <laughs> zoo. Right. Um, as always, guys, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, everything you do, every engagement you give the video, really helps us out and helps us grow the channel. And we are growing fast, and we are really, really Resuming. happy about that. Um, we're really proud of the growth we've had so far, and all of that is owed to our viewers. Um, and all the support you give us, which we really, really appreciate. This is a wonderful experience, and we are looking forward to continuing to grow the platform and raising money to benefit the Trevor Project on June 17th. So for the 20% of you that make it to this point in the video, um, that's your reminder that you should come watch and donate money to the Trevor Project. Yes. Please. Please do it. Anyway, this is the Skeleton Crew signing off. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have, have, have a beautiful time. <laughs>